Welcome to Malcolm Reed's How to Barbecue Right, a podcast where we talk about barbecue, share recipes, and discuss all things delicious. And now, here's your host, Malcolm and Rochelle Reed. Hey, welcome back to the How to Barbecue Right podcast. I'm your host, Malcolm Reed, joined by my lovely and talented wife, Miss Rochelle. Rochelle, how's it going? Good. Having a good week? Uh, it's been a busy week. It's um, been short. Yeah, it's been, yeah, we were short today. Because uh, we were Michael, on Easter break. Yeah, Michael's yeah. out of school Monday. My mom was still here visiting from the weekend, so. Didn't get much work done? Mm-mm. And I edited three videos this week. Uh, no, that's what we were going to talk about first, right? Those beefer videos. Yeah, the beefer videos. We actually, um, Cooper and Mateus from Beefer came out to the house, um, what was that, two or three weeks ago? Yeah. And we recorded those, um, and it just, we knew we had some other stuff we had to, look, what we were going to do before that. So we knew we'd hold them to this week. I thought it'd be a good time since this was a short week. And those videos turned out fantastic. You know, um, I kind of, if you read the description in those videos, I, in the, the B for intro, I kind of, uh, go in briefly how I met those guys, but we were up in Nashville at the National Hardware Show last spring and, um, we were just walking around out inside. Of course, they have a big trade show. All the people bringing their new grills for the year and all that. Then outside, they have like a, what they call the burn area. And that's where people are live cooking. There's, you know, grill demos. Uh, there are chefs doing stuff. It's pretty cool. It's the first time we ever went. And Beefer was out there and, you know, I didn't know anything about those type grills. There were several. They're kind of new. Yeah, they're, they've been big over in Europe a, a yeah, while. Yeah, but the they're kind of new to Beefer the Beefer was kind of the original, the the one that started it all, the whole craze, from they're what I was told. Like the, they're they're the, I guess, the Nike. Of, or, of, yeah, of, or whatever over you there. Call yeah, it, it's yeah. the big brand. Beefer's the brand. Yeah. Beefer's all the other the guys brand. are knockoffs, right? Yeah. But what it is, um, it's, it's, if you think of like a high end steakhouse where they have these high heat broilers, or sometimes you can see them called salamander grills or something like that. But a lot of you know, like, you know, the palm, Roosh Chris, um, a lot of these places are using those high heat to cook their steaks. Now it's not a, a charcoal grill or a grilled steak by any means. It's super seared at intense heat. And the thing does 1500 degrees. That's what was pretty cool about it. Roosh Chris is known for that because they do it in. In the butter, the yeah, butter that's what's so, that's the best part about a roost yeah. steak to me. That pan <laughs> butter that's in there. So, well, we knew someone that actually bought a roost Chris style cooker, and it was huge. Yeah, no, it was. It, I mean, it's a piece of kitchen equipment. Yes, I mean, it was. I mean, this thing's like twenty five grand or yeah, something like that. It was as big as a refrigerator. Yeah, no, it was bigger than that. It was. Yeah. It was. It was. It was wide. Yeah, you could do a lot of steaks on that thing. <laughs> And he had it at his shop, you know, that was, yeah. that was, that was cool. Well, he kind of did a lot of entertaining, so it made sense. But the, the beefer and the, the, the other models, the kind of the knockoffs after it were made for personal home use, mm-hmm. something that the ordinary guy can take, you know, add it along with your grill. It's kind of, it's kind of another way of cooking, um, besides grilling. And it's pretty cool. I yeah. mean, I, I, you know, when I first saw it, I, you know, I didn't know what to think. And they were cooking these steaks and turning them out in just a couple of minutes. And I'm like, well, you know, I can kind of see a spot for that. If you don't want to fire up a grill or you just want that seared steak. If you have an apartment. Oh, yeah, it'd be perfect for yeah. something like that. It runs off of propane. I think they actually have the, the way you can tra- uh, change it out to run off uh, natural gas, too, they told us. But it, um, one like little one pound bottle will run it for, six to eight hours or something like that. So a big, you know, like a standard barbecue bottle will last a long time. I don't yeah. know. I mean, it's very efficient. How many hours did he tell us? 40 hours or something? It was something, something incredible what it was. <clears throat> I guess you could just math it out, but it, <clears throat> excuse me. You would never run it <laughs> that long straight. I wouldn't think. I mean, why would you run the thing more than eight hours? You forget to turn it off. God, yeah, you have to. There's no way you can be, you you know how many steaks it. you would turn out <laughs> cooking one every three or four minutes <laughs> for eight hours. Because it, we did two recipes on it and both of them cooked in less than 10 minutes, I'd say. Oh yeah. Total cook time was nothing. Yeah. On them. I mean, you spend longer, you know, letting the meat. Like when he did steak, for instance, letting it set up top and kind of gradually come up to where it gets to that core temp and then putting it back in there and searing it, that was nothing. I thought that was pretty cool because I played around with it a little bit and I was just trying to get it down, you know, sear it, move it down low, keep letting it cook, flip it. 
And well, the we whole, were trying to put it like maybe in the middle to yeah, start with. I, I figured out a pretty good way to do it like that, but his way was much easier. Yeah. Uh, Chef Cooper's because you could just you know you just put it in the pan it's still getting those juices you're putting it up top or right in front still good and hot there and you can monitor the internal temps really yeah that's what that I way. liked about yeah. it you can stand over the thermo pan and watch it as it come up it was like every five degrees okay another minute okay it's five more so this is where we want to sear it so you, you can nail the doneness with it so um, with the steaks he did a sear first yeah. took it out. And and the residual heat from the sear is going to bring it up to internal temp, or the heat coming the heat off the, coming off that that fifteen hundred degree element, or in a it. little bit of both, because that element's right in the top of it. It's the only it's the only direction the heat comes from the top. So of course it's trying to throw it out the bottom. That's why the drip pan with the butter and all that works down bottom. And you could set the steak right in front of it down low, and it's still going to get some of that heat and still continue to cook it. But if you put it right on top, it's even hotter. Now it's not. I didn't touch it because he said, you know, you can touch the sides, you can touch the back, but don't touch the top. There's like warning stickers on it. Don't touch the top. <laughs> so it's still hot. I should have got my, you know, that's a good, that's a good question. I should get the little uh, temperature scanner and hit yeah. the top of it next time we crank it up and see what temp it actually is up there. But I know it, it took that one inch thick ribeye um, about, what was it, like seven minutes or something like that to come up to core temp. It wasn't, it wasn't as long as you would think it would. Mm-hmm. And then just one so more sear warm. to get it really good and crusty. Yeah, that, and the final sear, when he put it back in there the second time. Is that was, a par sear? The first one first was kind of <laughs> a par sear. Yeah, it would be. Is that a thing? But, but the final sear is what put that crust on it. And I don't know if the video, you could tell in the video it was still sizzling and it was all browned up when you pulled it out. But right there in person, man, you could smell all that fat that was sizzling. And you could, I mean, it just smelled like a steakhouse. The it was, it was only really good. The complaint I have about that is that you have you put your seasonings on at the end. Yeah. You know? Which I don't mind that really. Well, my thing is, I mean, I, if, I if you want to taste the steak or you want to taste what you're yeah. cooking on it, you're, I mean, that's what you get. You're pretty much cooking it in its raw form. I, I could see an aged steak shining in that because all your flavors in that aging process yeah. or something, you know, that, that would really be good. But as far, I mean, you're not going to put a rub on it. You're not going to marinate it. Now, could you marinate? That's because he marinated the salmon. And it, yeah, and it didn't burn. Mm-hmm. Um, they, you know, I asked, I kind of asked him, and they're all big. Don't, you know, don't put anything on it other than salt because everything else burns and salt won't burn as, you know, at that temp. Yeah. So that's why they go with salt. Well, I've been, you know, I played around with it and I seasoned it. But what I would do is I would season it, kind of dry brine it like we did that salmon. Put some seasons on it, let it set about an hour, flipping it every once in a while, kind of starts pulling moisture out. And then I would rinse everything off and patted it dry. Right. So those flavors were in the meat instead of being on top of it. And it didn't burn. It did fine. I mean, I hadn't, you know, I hadn't made a video of that yet, but it works. Believe me. You know me, I'm not just going to be okay. I got to do it. I got to do okay. it raw, <laughs> raw like that. I'm going I'm to push the boundary. <laughs> But man, well, those, I mean, you serve it with that steak butter. It really doesn't matter. That those steaks had, take that steak they had the steak butter and, and smoked uh, smoked sea salt that the smoked it, salt was really good. That Coop did himself, and it was really really good. Well, um, do you know how he did the the smoked salt? Yeah, he did that on, on a smoker at home. He just got some salt and put it in there low, like you're cold smoking it on a pan. Yeah, and just let it. I forget. I think he said he leaves it in there four hours. It was just like a really good sea salt yeah. that he used. It wasn't nothing, you know, that's hard to find. And then I think he put... It had oh, a color really. to it. Well, it changed it kind of a grayish look. Yeah. I mean, I guess that was from the smoke penetrating it. I think he said he used apple smoke, How I believe. How long did he smoke it? Four hours. Four hours. Yeah. So he just put it... On a sheet pan. On a sheet it's pan. It's super simple. So I had, I gave him my idea. I said, man, you should smoke some pepper. You know, whole peppercorns. Yeah. Why not put those in there along with your salt? And then you could make a season and crack that, you know, go through and crack all that smoked pepper. I bet it'd be great. I've never tried it, but. And then make you a salt and pepper shake blend. put on at the end. Well, yeah. could or you just smoke have other butter. ingredients. Yeah. I don't see why like not. Like herbs and you could do spices. All that. Yeah. Yeah. You can smoke. I mean, I don't know if it does any good. Smoke some herbs or something. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of herbs you smoking? <laughs> but, but what was cool. I mean, so we did that compound butter in the bottom too. That was good. Just a, it was, it was, that was my steak butter. He said, You got any butter? So hold on, let me make a steak butter. Yeah. And I just took shallot and some parsley and some of that smoked salt and 
whipped it up with a stick of butter and formed it back into a log. Some garlic was in there. And I make that all the time. That's like yeah. it stays. There's some of that in my refrigerator all the time. And, you know, um, I found a butter in the grocery store. And I, I found it one time. It was Lando Lakes. And it was called Herb and Shallot. Herb and Shallot. Yep, yep. Lando Lakes is only in a tub. They don't have it in the stick. But it's very similar to Man, that. Man, that was good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we've been looking <laughs> for that at It's not as Kroger. good as it is yours is, yeah. but it's still good pitch. for a for a tub butter. Yeah. Um now we also did the salmon. Mm-hmm. And that was the one where you're talking about he dry brined it. He took some some of his uh, smoked sea Real salt. Simple recipe. Smoked sea salt and brown sugar, both sides, threw it in a bag, whatever fell off, just raked that off in there too. Yeah. Good shot of whiskey. Let that sit a couple hours. He said you could go overnight with it and then took it out, washed it off, and then dried it and just kind of let it come up to room temp. You don't have to let that pellicle form on it because we're not smoking it. We're not trying to get smoke flavor to adhere to the fish. So it's ready to go. You know, normally if you're going to smoke salmon, you let that sit overnight and then let that pellicle form on it to where it's really going to absorb some smoke. But this, we're just going for a grilled or not a grilled, a seared piece of salmon. And that's exactly what it did. So he did some side dish with it too. We used the the big what's, what's the big beefer? I call so it the good. big beefer. It's like the XL. <laughs> the XL, yeah. The big beefer. It is the big beefer. That's what it is. <laughs> so we did in the tray at the bottom of it some asparagus, some garlic sliced thin, some red like onion, red onion sliced thin, and then sliced little baby portobellas with a couple more pats of butter. And just stir that up, you know, every those once in a so while. Good. And it, they, we gave them he a little head start. He started those five minutes early. He yeah. put them in the bottom. Very bottom. Yeah, very bottom. Still wide open. Yeah. He said he runs a big for wide. Both of them, you run it wide open. He never turns it down. So when you turn it on, it turns on wide open and you roll. And it don't take it long to get up there. Five, five minutes. minutes. Yeah, yeah, to get good and hot. And then the salmon went on the little racks. A minute, about midways up, three inches or so from the, the top element. Flipped it, which... That's the hardest thing to cook at fish is flipping it. Yeah, and everybody knows. It no problem. Yeah, with those tweezers. I mean, yeah. it was it was easy, but putting in that brine firmed that fish up, so it made it to where it, it didn't fall apart. And then he flipped it another minute, a little bit closer this time, and then took it back off, flipped it one more time, and then put a good sear on the top, and that's what made it so good. Yeah, because you got a little crunch on the outside. And then the inside was still just perfectly cooked it fish. All it wasn't overcooked, yeah. wasn't dry. Now he did finish that with a little lemon juice. What was it? Dill, Dill and, and then pepper. a little black cracked black, black, black pepper. pepper. And that was it. And we ate the vegetables with it and the beef were The vegetables beef were impressed me, man. Yeah. I'm, the vegetables were really good. Like you could do that meal. Any night of the week. Oh yeah. Week. If you did yeah. your salmon the night before and all you had to do is come home, turn it, you know, fire up the beefer and then Throw all that stuff in there, it'd be easy. But you could, I mean, just think you could do zucchini. You could do all kinds of, any kind of vegetable that's great on the grill would work in that. Yeah. I bet shrimp would be really good. We need to try that. Oh, yeah. You know. You tried pork belly in there. Oh, man. It really, it, it puts the crackle on the pork belly. <laughs> I will that's be doing that. That's coming. Yeah. You need a smoker for that, too, because you're not cooking it all the way yeah, on there. Yeah. Um, that, but so it was good. That salmon recipe, uh, could you take the salmon? Do that procedure to it and then put it on another grill or another smoker. Just use the salt, the brown sugar, bourbon. Oh, and, and grill a piece overnight. of salt. Yeah, you could grill it grill. like that. Yeah, you yeah. could just grill it. If you didn't have the beef or like you wanted to do that recipe, yeah. Or throw it's it on a Traeger for yeah. oh, yeah. know, 350 or then something. Then let, let it cook to it's done. Yeah. yeah, you could easily do it. I mean, the beef is pretty interesting. I mean, I'm not saying it's the grill, you know, the the piece of equipment to replace all grills, but I would love, you know, like I think sitting beside a grill, like if if they made another grill and then you know how grills have the little side table, the infrared burner, get rid of that and set a beefer there. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's all you need. It's an ultimate finishing tool. It is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you think of all the stuff you could see. I mean, melt cheese, you could do all kinds of stuff. Oh yeah. Yeah. And even the the big, the little one, I have a pizza pizza stone for the little one. And then, so it makes like, if you think of the uh, school lunch size yeah. pizzas, the little it's square like ones, a loaf bread. That's pizza. about the size you could put in there. I mean, you could make you know some little what do they call them artisan pizzas? Yeah. When you just make a little personal one with the dough stretched out, funny little way. But the <laughs> but the big the big beefer the XL has a big pizza stone that goes in it, and you can and put a, a whole, you can put a ten inch pizza there. in yeah. it. Yeah. 
Um, and Easy. Yet, I hate, I, I really try not to do anything too salesy. We're, we don't like to put infomercials on, you know. Yeah, yeah. We really try not to do that. But at the same time, this thing's new and it's pretty cool and we want to let people know about that's it. A, that's what we want. Like. The only reason why, when I met those guys up there in Nashville, I thought so I want to learn more. Yeah. And so I didn't talk to them. They were so crowded at, at Nashville, we didn't get to talk a whole lot. I mean, I asked some questions and kind of met them. But then we run into those guys again at the World Foods. And Beefer was holding its own category where they had, they took the people that, was it the ones top, that, that finished in the top, top 10 or something like that, that didn't get to the, the pass on? Five through eight both yeah, days. Yeah. Got to cook in the little Beefer challenge and Emily got to do it from Swine Life. And that's really where we met them and got to hanging out with them more. And I told them, I was like, man, if y'all would like to come out and do a video, I'd like to see firsthand, you know, give me some one-on-one instruction on how to do it. And, and man, it was, I was glad they came out. Yeah. I feel like we learned how to use the beef for a yeah. lot better because we've had one since November. Yeah, because I brought one back with me then because I yeah. knew they were coming and they were flying in instead of traveling with it. So, so he so said, played with "Take it that a home and bit. play with it over the winter." And I did. You know, when it was too cold to fire up the grill, I had the beef in my garage. Now they don't recommend doing it indoors, but <laughs> I'd crack the garage door so some air would flow and I fire it up. up. I'd go out there and beef it or leave it. <laughs> beef it or leave it. That's it. I would uh, in five minutes. I'd have a steak cooked uh-huh. back in the house and didn't mess up the kitchen. That was that was a cool thing. So. Now we can do all kinds of stuff. Yeah. The big one. Um, yeah, and they're huge in Germany. They were telling us about how big they are in Germany. You know, the they're thing, a big thing. The thing with that was But they a don't lot have of, as much space, I guess, like that, backyards. Well, yeah, and they don't have the fuel, like the wood and the charcoal. Oh, I mean, yeah. barbecue's growing over there, but, I mean, he, he told, they told me that a lot of chefs are buying those and using them. So you see all these competitions over there. Those guys are using them in comps. Not like barbecue comps and cooking comps, you know. Yeah. And they like are, they have type. them in restaurants. You know, they make restaurant models and stuff. They're not, I don't know if they're selling those in the U.S. yet, but they, they do have, you know, the European models and restaurants. And I mean, they they meet all the requirements to go in a commercial kitchen, you yeah. know, as far as, I mean, they just started really selling them over here in the past year. Year. Yeah. That's what I mean. And I've seen several different knockoffs already. Yeah. Out there. A lot. I mean, there was, there was, Four we or five that, at the hardware show. Yeah. We knew somebody that brought, bought a knockoff. And Off was, Amazon. Yeah. yeah. I don't think he Didn't was. come with the same accessories. Mm-hmm. The build quality, you could tell they cut corn. It probably made in China. Yeah. I imagine that's what they did. They took somebody's, changed a few things, and so it wouldn't, you know, be a straight copy. Yeah. And then and made it for a Saved him a hundred bucks. Saved a hundred bucks, yeah. <laughs> got a crappy beaver. A crappy beaver. <laughs> that's funny. So what are we talking about? Besides the videos we did. Main topic for the week. Main topic for the week. What is it? I want to talk about, I guess, the evolution of how you cook. Of how I cook? Oh, like yeah. barbecue? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, that's a good like one. Like how your cooking has changed. Well. And has it? Heck yeah, it's changed. It's still changing. <laughs> I change. I, I pre, you know, I've always preached in classes, you don't change. You make small changes. But that's, you evolve. That's a better word yeah. than change. Evolve. Because you want you to learn. get better. And you learn, and you apply what you're you learn. Yeah, yeah, I'm a student of barbecue. Oh, you'll never master it. There's no, you know, there's no finish line. It's, it's all, it's all learn and apply it and see what you can do better. You know, yeah. I mean, there's a million ways to do what we do, but I'm always trying to learn something else. Yeah. Well, there's people out there that are like, well, you're not supposed to do it that way. You're supposed to do it this way. Says who? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's always been me. If I didn't try that, I mean, I'd be stuck doing the same old thing all the time. Every I'd be time. boring as crap. Yeah. So mine, I started out. One method. I remember specifically, we started out cooking barbecue because we were going to South Haven Spring Fest, which, man, it's been going on since I was a kid. I mean, it's this weekend. We're going to cook. We're leaving here and going there tomorrow to cook South Haven Spring Fest. Well, that was my first, you know, dabbling in barbecue was hanging around there as a kid. And it wasn't uh, near as big big a deal is it or did the people yeah, take I think it, as, it was a huge deal well i know but like the cook side of it very big really it, this was a memphis and may in its heyday and Back that was when they the had a memphis and may circuit yeah and so there was um a big a little company in memphis called AutoZone. i know you've probably heard of them <laughs> <laughs> well they always brought out Man, I don't know, a dozen teams, just AutoZone teams. Oh, really? And they that's how they determined who was going to cook. Who's going to be the head cook in, in Memphis Yeah, May. Memphis and May was how well they did at Springfest. And then all these other teams, I mean, you know, Mike Mills, when they were running hard, Myron Mixon, 
I mean, all these people. I saw Myron's going to be there yeah. this weekend. This year, yeah, he's cooking. He's back at Spring Fest. I mean, this was this has been. I mean, they've been that contest has been a big deal for a long time. Yeah. But um, so that was where I first got into barbecue, and of course it was ribs. That's what everybody wanted to learn how to cook. So me and Waylon put our money together, and he was working. He was a grocery bagger at the time in high school, and they had these little grills, these little thin. Everybody seen them, the little thin grills, yeah. like a, not a, it wasn't even a char broiler. It was like somebody had made them. Are they tall? And they like, thin? like no, no, they weren't tall. They were just a fifty-five gallon drum on its oh. side, kind of. But it wasn't a drum, but it shaped like Did a drum. Did it have a side box? had a side fire box. Okay. And it was some somebody had made, and I guess talked to the store manager, and they let them set them out front, you know, on the okay. sidewalk and sell them. I think they were 150 bucks. So we put, you know, our money together and bought us one. And then we would set it out, you know, at our house and go get ri- I mean, ribs. was the first time we cooked. We didn't know nothing about cutting ribs down, taking the membrane off, baby backs from spares. We didn't know any of that. We just bought ribs. <laughs> and we would set out there, and we would – you know, I mean, there wasn't even, there wasn't a lot of rubs and sauces. Nothing was big. The internet yeah. wasn't even around. This was way before all that. Yeah. So number five was what everybody, I don't know if everybody's seen Flavor Robin number five. Well, that I started remember, in Memphis. I remember having to make trips to the grocery store. Because it was, yeah, it was like a specialty grocery store carried yeah. it. Yeah. And I used number to have to go buy you bags of number five. Number five. Well, that was the old standby. That was a lot of people based their rub recipes on number five. And I bet it's, I mean, it's a, that's kind of what everybody's formed them for the ones that are out yeah. now were, you know, kind of a, I guess, what would you say? A knock, not a knockoff because you take it and you take that as a foundation and you add to it to make it unique. But number five is the base, the basic barbecue rub, like the one Shane and Lawson came and made. Yeah. That's like number five, you know, <laughs> this is how, and it was, everybody had, you could get it, you could get a pound of it for five bucks. Yeah. It was super and so cheap. that's what we started with. It was salty as crap too. <laughs> I hadn't tried number five in years, but man, it was so salty. But that's what we did. And we, uh, we learned, you know, we, we decided that, uh, we wanted to cook competition barbecue. Did you know barbecue. anybody that could cook, that was cooking competition barbecue? Well, the only person that was good at Wayland it. had a friend, David Logan, and his dad had killer hogs. He was killer. That's what it said on his shirt. He started killer hogs from, it was a deer, a bunch of deer hunting buddies and they cooked it just to have fun. They always did the backyard. There was never pros. Um, and he cooked ribs on an old refrigerator. They had gutted. It was like a metal refrigerator and welded a beer keg on the back. And that was, his, that was his rib cooker. <laughs> and we, I remember the first year we went, he was going to teach us how to cook ribs. And then we were going, we were entering uh, two categories. It was ribs and sausage, anything but, and we did deer sausage. That was what it was. And it was just links of deer sausage that we cooked on this. And this other grill he had was, a monster. Uh, it was just a monster. Six of us could get in it and stand shoulder to shoulder. <laughs> it was on a yacht hauling trailer. And the first 30 feet of it was like wood floor with this big smoker that probably weighed 8,000 pounds on it. The first 30 feet of it. Yeah. And then the, la- <laughs> then the last 20 feet was just open. And that's where we stuck charcoal. And we must have brought, I don't know, conservatively... <laughs> Four pallets of Kingsford charcoal to that contest, and we began burning them. And this thing ate them like we were working a dead gum steam motor. And we shoveled coal from th- from Thursday morning until Saturday afternoon. <laughs> and while we were cooking, was deer sausage <laughs> and, and whole spare ribs. I don't even think they were cut down. So his you know, he had a secret rub recipe that he made. Somebody <laughs> stole from a Memphis and May team that supposedly won. There's always that recipe. Yeah, this recipe yeah. won Memphis and May. And so he brought it and then had some sauce that somebody made. They had wrote down on a sheet of paper. You yeah. know, and it was the old Memphis and May winning sauce. And we got stomped. I mean, it was – but, but you know, we were setting up. This was our first thing. So we get there and we see all these teams setting up. They got their barbecue trophies. This is when you brought every, you know, barbecue trophy yeah, you had. You set up a table. Yeah, because you had on-site judges. Well, we didn't have any. So we, we had – we went and got our old baseball trophies, <laughs> football trophies. I think Wayland had a car show trophy. We had all that setting up there. I mean, gr- rookies as we could be. Didn't know anything. Were you all but doing we, that like funny? No, we were serious. No, we had on like matching shirts and he made us wear these high my name is with our, cause we didn't have, to, we didn't know we were supposed to get our name stitched on them. So we had on these like polo shirts with high my name is Malcolm on it. And, and then we had killer hogs hats that were, I don't even know what they were. It was before trucker hats were cool. It was, I mean, it was just probably some lame hat, but that's what we had to wear every day. There was no running water. I think we had an old generator, but it was one of them loud ones that you can't even, you know, you can hear half a mile down the road. 
that's what everybody had back then. That's the only power you had. And we began to have a good time. And we had a, we had a big time. And that's where I first got started. So that was my evolution in barbecue. I started there. Then from that, from there, we graduated up to getting us some bathtubs that my buddy Heath had. And we had, it was like two old school bathtubs, the old claw foot ones, yeah. the metal ones. Then they were like hinged where they were one on top of the other. And you cook, like you built a fire on one side and you smoked on the other side of these bathtubs. And the drains were one was your exhaust on the bottom and one was the exhaust on your top. So it was kind of like a monster PK. And now that I think about it, that's, that's kind of what it was, yeah. drawing across, you know. Yeah. And we cooked, we, we started cooking baby back ribs finally. And we would get them from Raymond's Meat Market. That was, you know, where everybody went back then. Yeah. And I kind of learned from just going to contests and making buddies and seeing what other grills people were cooking on. New Year's, did you think you were cooking good ribs then? Oh, yeah. We thought we were winners every time. We were heartbroken. Yeah. Waylon would cry sometimes because we didn't get calls. <laughs> I mean, we didn't know. We didn't know. I mean, we, I remember the first call we ever got. But you would eat was the rib red beans and, be and like, rice. There can't be any better rib than this. Yeah, and then until somebody <laughs> next door to you, a pro team would let you try theirs, and then it would just blow you away. Yeah. It was like, well, and that's you know, I got really good at tasting what people were turning in. They would let us taste them, and then I'd so I know what the texture was supposed to be like. I knew what the dumbness was supposed to be like. You know what the flavor and then profile. I knew, it, I knew it, and so all it took was figuring out how to cook them. And back then we did the three two one ribs, two twenty five. That's what everybody thought they had to cook at. Yeah. And we back on the bathtubs, we were probably cooking at like one eighty. We didn't know <laughs> what was a thermometer. We didn't have we didn't have we You're didn't have thermopins. We didn't have thermopins or anything like that. <laughs> but but we learned we learned you needed aluminum foil to wrap them and get them tender. And and this is I mean that's were how you it started. Ribs back then we just put them on and cooked them. Yeah. <laughs> I mean we didn't you know. But then we learned you got to get baby back ribs. Somebody would tell you that. Oh, yeah, everybody's cooking baby back ribs. You need them. Then they'd say, you know, are you wrapping? I'm like, what? You know, it's like, <laughs> then we'd start wrapping. And then, you know, are you, well, are you using a little blues hog or head country? And so it just kind of evolved to that, to what, to what it was. And when we got I was better. making notes for this, the one thing I said is when you go into the world of competition barbecue, it's one thing to sit in your backyard and be like, this is the best rib I've ever had, but put it up against a bunch of other people oh, yeah. out there cooking. You'll figure out real quick. Humbles you real yeah, quick. Yeah. So yeah. you either leave or you get better, you know? But all that time, it was, that was around party days. And we, we didn't concentrate on cooking as much as we did having a good time. I mean, we brought the DJ booth and the, you know, the bar and kegs of beer and all that and had a great time. Chase but then chased, did. chased all the girls around. But then it got to the point to where, we wanted to get better, and so we saw people were cooking on different equipment. Mark Lambert was selling backwoods. And everybody was wanting backwoods, so we saved up our money and we bought us a little party smoker. But that was—I think that was before Mark was even selling. We had to drive to Dyersburg, Tennessee. Bad Bob was selling them. He sold Traegers and he sold backwoods. And this really? was—and when I talk about Traegers, this wasn't like Traegers like you think of now. Yeah, he, this he, is before the new. Oh the, yeah, he would sell the old barrel, tra- um, the steel Traegers that were like. Um, pipes that they were made people would put traeger control units on and then he had this other one that was on an axle it looked like a garage door it was a big box had a roll-up garage door i remember those yeah those were the first you know generation pellet grills that i ever saw originals and then so he but we bought a backwoods from him and we took that backwoods everywhere we would load it up throw it in the back of a truck and we'd go cook ribs and we might you know we we slowly edged our way up from from the back of the pack to the middle to finally cracking the top 10 and then it just finally clicked. We, you know, we got on a good roll where we, we started hitting, figuring out what the judges need wanted. And, um, about that time we decided we were going to take a judging class and I wish I would have done that. And I tell everybody that always go take a judging class. If you think you're going to get into a competition, I don't care what it is, go judge it first. So you know what they're looking for. How, you know, how are you going to, how are you going to throw darts at it if you don't know what the target is? So that's what ju- taking a judging class does. So once we did that, cheap, usually. oh yeah, I mean the class is nothing. You don't learn much in the class at all. It just gives you the right to go out and judge, and yeah. that's where you learn. That's where you see all this stuff coming in. You're around these other judges that are talking about it after it's been judged. You know, oh, we like this one because it was sweet, or this one because it had a little more heat, or this is the perfect tenderness. And you can go back and make mental notes or whatever. I just tried to observe everything, and that's that's how I learned, and and that took me. That took me into cooking other things too, because we added whole shoulders. 
And nobody was cooking pork butts back then. We didn't know what pork butts were. To me, um, we we cooked whole shoulders or we cooked picnic shoulders. And picnic shoulders is what we cooked at home. I mean, did they not sell pork butts locally? I know, I don't know. I really didn't know what to. I didn't. We didn't look for them. Yeah. Every Memphis is where I grew up. Has always been whole shoulders. So our grocery stores had whole shoulders. I'm sure they may have had some butts, but they weren't like they are today. You didn't yeah. go to the grocery store to see loads of them. Um, but they always had picnics. And they always had those. So that's when we added that, and then you know, years later, we added whole hog. And then I started doing recipes and videos. And, and you jumped to KCBS. Yeah, and so. jumped to KCS cooking chicken and, and beef. So starting out cooking ribs and pork kind of took me to wanting to the curiosity to learn how to cook these other things and develop my own recipes. And, and then, you know, of course, the Internet blew up. And then you had forums to st- at the start, which everybody yeah. got on forums and read and shared. It, the barbecue bug. Mm, there was all so, kinds of them. The the one that that I really liked, I thought was well, it didn't get a whole lot of notice. Was the pickled pig? Mm. That was one I thought that guy did a great job, and he put out his comp stuff on it, like comp chicken, how to build a blind box. He had all that stuff on there, and when I saw that, that's where I learned to build a drum from. I took and I gave him credit on you know on on the on my stuff how to build a drum was kind of off his uh, tutorial on how to build your own drum. And, and I guess the cookers kind of changed. We went to, once we got our backwoods, we were cooking on water cookers, which is perfect for pork, but it doesn't do as good on brisket or chicken because, you know, it's a moist environment. You got all that water in there that's steaming. So it doesn't want the out, it doesn't want to get chicken skin crispy and it doesn't make a good bark on beef. I mean, it gets it tender, but it don't make a good bark on it. So then we kind of went away from cooking on water cookers to cook it on dry heat. And that's how we kind of got onto the drums and to the uh, old hickories that we're on. And then I learned about pellet grills and I got my first pellet grill, which is that Yoder. And that's where I started cooking a lot of recipes. When I got the Yoder, I started making up my own recipes, cooking different things, you know, the hams, the turkeys. That's when uh, we, yes, kind of started how to barbecue right. That was when you, how to barbecue you right. Had, you had your old hickory, but we were using that for comps a lot. Yeah, that's all we and used it for. You had the drum and the Yoder. And that was pretty much that it. Was what, and I think I had a Weber. Yeah, I mean that was one of the old kettle web. I still have. Oh that was that was the one you won of uh, <laughs> from Marlboro sweepstakes or something. <laughs> I logged on every day and like checked a little thing. And you got enough checks, enough yeah. points, finally to pick something out of the yeah. Marlboro catalog. <laughs> did you have to? <laughs> that was my birthday present to you because I didn't have any money. It was great. I that you know that cooker. I actually won. The uh, SC at my first SCA at um, at the Dog Southland track, Greyhound yeah. Park over in West Memphis. It was like an eight thousand dollar contest on that free marble grill. <laughs> and then the second year, I went back and did it again. I said, "I got to cook on that same grill," and I won it again. So that grill brought me some luck. Yeah, I hope it's still bringing somebody else some luck. Where is it now? We finally set it on the curb because oh. <laughs> <laughs> I got a new one. Remember, I had to buy a new one one year. Cause yeah. It, but that was my, you know, that's kind of how I evolved into cooking. I mean, it was. Well, how have your recipes and methods changed? Well, we took, so I'm always looking for something better, you know, and, and or, or to tweak. And I kind of found out, you know, those first, those early days, everybody was cooking at 225, which was great for low and slow cooking. And, you know, you could get the tenderness there, but I found out gradually and was cooking on the drum and on the Traeger that 235 to 250 produced a little bit better barbecue for me. I thought it rendered the meat a little bit better. The times were faster, but not by a whole lot. But instead of having that three-hour initial phase on a slab of ribs, we took it down to two hours. And then instead of having to wrap for a whole two hours, we got to checking our ribs at the hour mark and seeing where they were, you know, kind of feeling on them, see if the bones were pulling back, see if they were starting to get loose. And so we got that wrap time down to about an hour and a half. And then the last part, which was the three, two, the one, it doesn't really take an hour to set a, a glaze on something on the grill when you're cooking a little bit hotter. Now, if you're cooking on a water cooker at 225, yeah, you need a whole hour yeah. to, to try to set it. It's still not going to set perfect. But when you, when you start cooking on dry heat, like drums or pellet grills or the old hickory or ceramic grills, anything that doesn't have a lot of moisture in it, the dry heat sets it a lot faster. So we cut it our times plenty. down and I think it turns out a better product. Yeah. You know, we went through a transition where 
we would take a backwoods and our old hickory on a trailer and we would start our pork out, our ribs and our butts on the water cooker. Cause we loved the way it, you know, you weren't going to burn anything up. They didn't get too dark. They had beautiful color. And then we realized that once you wrap it, it don't matter what kind of heat it's on dry heat or moist heat. It's wrapped up. It's already getting hammered inside that wrap. So we could move everything over to the old hickory. And then we started out cooking chicken. I tried cooking it on the backwoods, but then I learned that it's so much better on a drum. You get better flavor. The skin turns out better just all the way around. So it was kind of like this evolution of of learning and just trial and error. I mean, it, it all goes back down to trial and error. Everything that I've done and learned is because I've got experience doing it the wrong way first. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I guess there really is no wrong way. It's just there's a better way, hey, and you can learn from cooking. it. Yeah, yeah, as long as you're out there cooking, that's what I say. I mean, I, well, every time I get in the kitchen and cook something, I either turn out something really good or I learn something. That's it. There's no. I mean, it's not a failure. Does it? I mean, do you burn something up or burn something occasionally? Yeah. But it's not total failure. I mean, you learn something. You learn what you did wrong. I mean, that's the way I look. I think it's a better way. I mean, to look at anything, not just cooking. That's just a better way to look at life. You yeah. know. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> There's not, we all make mistakes. We just got to learn from them and you, and, and look, look at those as learning moments. Well, I've had a lot of learning moments in my life. From <laughs> I make the, a ton of mistakes. From the um, first videos and recipes that we started turning out, do you think you've gotten more comfortable over the years I've and confident? Definitely in, in, on camera and cooking. Yeah. I mean, I, now I'm, I mean, I'm pretty confident that I could jump in on any grill or any kitchen and, and turn out something that was pretty good. Yeah. But it, I mean, I think it, it comes along with putting those hours in. Um, you know, if, if you do something long enough, you're going to get pretty good at it. And so that's kind of, you know, like this podcast. We're Saying learning. We're trying to get better, but <laughs> but we hadn't put in enough hours with it yet. So you, say you weren't born a barbecue? No, I wasn't. Guru. I was not. I don't know if I am now. I don't. I don't consider myself one. But no, I wasn't. I mean, I, it's all it's all learned. Um, and I can't say that I'm self-taught either. I mean, I took the, you know, I was the one putting in the hours doing it, but I've learned so much from other people and applying yeah. that that's not self-taught just because I did it. I mean, you guys, I mean, not all your friends, but a large majority of your friends, you, you guys would sit around and talk about cooking for all the time. Hours. That's, that's, yeah. that's our addiction. We'll call each other. Talking about <laughs> cooking. That's the circle I run in. <laughs> A bunch of wannabe cooks, a bunch of wannabe barbecue cooks. I don't even know if we're pit masters, but we love it. And it's a lot of fun, you know? You know, one thing, um, a few years ago, you'd never use butcher paper. No, that was something that, that I, that I evolved to use it at home, especially because I love the texture that it gives the, the meat. And I've even done it with ribs here recently. They turned out great. I mean, for the brisket, I cook, when I cook brisket at home, I always use it because I like, I like the texture. I like that crust, that, that oh, yeah. meteoriteness, that, that, you know, all those seasonings that cook down on the top of it. I, I like the way the fat turns out on it. Yeah, the fat's kind of crispy and good and melt in your mouth <laughs> on a butcher. It's not like that on a, on a full brisket. Yeah. I don't even know exactly what it does, but I can, t- when I taste a brisket that's been wrapped in butcher paper, to me, it tastes so much better. It is. It's, I don't it's, know if it's really the good. rest or the smoke penetration or what. And you know, at home, I don't eat competition style ribs. No. Nah. We cook those for judges, and that's strictly. I mean, when I'm when I'm cooking them at home, I want to eat. I want to taste the meat for one. I want to use some seasons. I don't use a ton of different rubs. I may put some rub on it, but I'm not using a bunch of different ones. Most of the time, I'm using mine. Yeah. I mean, just because I mean, I like it. It doesn't. It's not offensive. It gives a good color, but I can taste. You know, I can taste the meat, and then I can use my salt and pepper, the AP as a as a base on stuff, and that's just salt, pepper, and garlic. I mean, it's you know, you don't have to buy that. Just make it. Everybody's got salt, pepper, and garlic, I would think. Or you could buy it. Or you can buy it, yeah, <laughs> if you support us. <laughs> um, have you ever soaked wood? Yeah, yeah I, had a, <laughs> I had a note of that. And that was, you know, the first – so the first time we, we thought you had to bring well, – I remember – We brought, remember we brought doing- four pallets of Kingsford, but I bet we had two cords of hickory. Good yeah. hickory, too. I'm talking about strong hickory. <laughs> And we had five gallon buckets that we'd stick these splits in and soak them. Or we did have some chunks, but we soaked every bit of it. We made wood tea pretty much. 
And that's what everybody did. And you throw it on, you throw it on the hot coals, and man, it smoked like a freight train, you know. You thought you'd and do it, so. we we were smoking, and that's how I thought it was supposed to be done. Yeah. I remember there was a place in Memphis that we got, we would get our hickory wood from. They made axe handles, and so they would sell the drops. They would uh, package them all up in these big, like uh, fifty pound sacks, like untreated. Yeah, just raw yeah. hickory axe handles, the drops. You know, where they spin them on the lathe, yeah. they cut the handle out. Well, there'd be so much of it. And they were about. They're about the size of a perfect split to run on a stick burner. And we would go buy those and they would also, where they would shave them, where they would turn the axe handle on the lathe, it would create these chips. So you could buy a bag of those and we soaked all that stuff. <laughs> and that's, you know, that's what we use for wood. And then we, we learned, you know, oh, these guys are using fruit wood. So we would go to the charcoal store. That's where I found it. And on Florida street in Memphis, and he would sell the fruit wood. He sold cheap charcoal. That was where we started, you know, getting that, uh, chef's delight. And then it was way cheaper than it was, you know, it's premium charcoal is just sold cheaper than anywhere because he distributed it to the restaurants or to these other stores that were selling it. And you could get it for four bucks a bag back then, which was cheap. It was the hood. I ain't gonna lie. It was sketchy. You didn't want to go at dark. He wouldn't open at dark. Uh It was one of those type places. Oh, he shut down at like two. Yeah, that's because it was cocktail hour. Oh yeah, <laughs> but but <laughs> but we started getting our wood from him, and he had, he st- he would have apple and cherry and uh, peach usually, and then so we started adding fruit wood. We'd soak that too. It wasn't until years like you know a few years later we found out don't soak the wood. You want dry wood to really give you the flavor because it's not about that heavy smoke. We want the thin blue smoke, and I didn't learn that for a long time. I I mean, it's so easy now for somebody to come into barbecue and get ahead of the game. If you're, you know, getting the information's out there. Yeah, because there's so much more information. I mean, kids today are, you know, whoever's getting into barbecue today has got so much more advantage because there's people that's done all that homework and it's all out there for, you know, if you, if you want the information, it's out there. Back when you were coming up, it It was, you you either had to to know the right people or find out the hard way. That's right. Well, there wasn't, it was harder to find. I mean, you know, you got to think we were, a lot of times the only experience we have with barbecue is if you got to go to a restaurant or, you know, family reunions, holidays, stuff like that. That was when we barbecue. I grew up always having barbecue, yeah. but we didn't hang around and talk about it. You know, my parents didn't, they didn't have friends that were, they would call on the phone, talk about barbecue. <laughs> that didn't, it didn't happen. You know, it wasn't until I started getting into the competition scene and finding those people. people do either. I'm sure they do. I think everybody does now, don't they? It's like common at the dinner table. <laughs> At least in the, in the circles of friends I want to have. How how has your brisket changed? Oh, I remember man. the first Wagyu brisket you cooked, and it was supposed. Oh, we were all excited. You were cooking Wagyu brisket, you know, because it was a big deal for yeah, us. It was a lot of strobes, wasn't wasn't it? Yeah, it was yeah. a strobe. And I remember tasting it and being like, hmm. expected it to be better. <laughs> <laughs> they were bad. This is, I mean, it, our brisket. You can go back. We've had, had some Michael. pictures. Yeah, we've got pictures of some of the briskets that that we cooked back we in the day. Where we would slather them in mustard and then cook them on the backwoods, and they would just be, and then we'd cut them, you know, the best we could, hack them up. <laughs> Bob, my cousin Bob was the brisket man. He was the one, he was the first part I ever had cooked brisket. I didn't know what brisket was. I mean, I had corned beef because that was always like, you know, some corned beef and cabbage yeah. around St. Patrick's Day, but that was always cooked in the oven in a big roasting pan or a bag. You know, one thing, I didn't even have this on the notes, but it used to be very regional, you know? Brisket. We did, yeah. Or, yeah. No, barbecue in general. Oh, yeah. It, it is. Like you were talking about, we only had pork shoulders here, you know? Yeah. And Texas has, you know, we didn't have brisket here. They had brisket. Yeah. yeah. But they didn't eat a lot of pulled pork. Yeah. Nobody probably ate pulled pork in Texas. And now you're, you can get more. Variety. Well, yeah. You see these restaurants popping up now that are, they've got all four, you know? They're, 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 they're doing, you can get Texas brisket and you can get, Memphis or Carolina style pork and yeah. you can get, you know, Kansas city ribs. And it's like one restaurant does it all. It's, it, and I guess that's good because barbecue's grown so big like that, that people know what it is. And it's spread. Yeah. yeah. People, you know, what well, I didn't grow up knowing what tri-tip was. Heck no. I didn't have tri-tip. Yeah. I mean, the, the video we did was probably my first endeavor with tri-tip. <laughs> the first video you can go back and look. Yeah. You know, that, that was a long time ago. I don't even know. I, th- I think I do know. I bought it from Creekstone. I'm I pretty sure. Got it from, uh, Thomas's, Thomas's Meat, Meat Market. Market. Yeah, but yeah. it was a Creekstone. That was the first time I ever got tri-tip. Before that, I did something. I called it a sirloin tip roast. I remember that now because I was trying to get tri-tip and nobody knew what tri-tip was. 
I go to the butcher. Yeah, we got we got tip roast. And so I said, not I think I called it not a tri tip. Or do you remember that video? <laughs> uh-huh. This is the old house. It's yeah. been a while back. You can go back and watch it. It's pretty much just like a, a roast. It's a sirloin roast. I mean, I cooked it rare, I'm sure, and sliced it up. But it's not like tri. It wasn't tri tip. Yeah. I think I said that, and I don't know if we did a video, if it was just a blog post back when I our newsletter back when we were doing back a lot of newsletters. We did new, uh, new videos, yeah. yeah. I'm gonna go back and look at that. Has your steak cooking changed? Mm, yeah, I mean, slowly. Yeah. Because when I came in to cooking steaks, I kind of had a good grasp on how those comp guys did it. I mean, it's not how we used to cook them at home because I always marinated steaks and. Then we would grill them, and it wouldn't it wouldn't be like so hot and so fast, you know. That's, that's kind of the way my mom and dad cook steaks. Yeah, we just we just marinate a steak and throw it on the grill. When it's done, it's done. I mean, we, I mean, we try you to cook them medium rare, but the cross hatch and things no, like we that. didn't do all that. But then, I guess the SCA had kind of gotten started, and there was enough guys talking about it, I'm sharing talking, what they knew. I'm talking about from the first time you started cooking steaks. I don't, I mean, I've all, we've always cooked. I grew up, now we grew up eating steak. Yeah. So it was always been a grill. I mean, that's commonplace. But from the way, from my way I cook them now to where, yeah, I would say that's changed totally. Yeah. I remember the first steak you cooked for me. Really? Uh-huh. What was it, a ribeye? I think or, so, yeah. It was yeah. a filet. It was a ribeye. Huh. I don't remember that. You invited me over for a steak. And I cooked you a steak? Yeah. Was it good? Oh, uh, your parents were there, and I wasn't expecting them to be. And we weren't dating very long at all. I was uh, like, huh. I was ready to introduce you to the family. <laughs> I don't think you thought it through. You I was, was a like, proper diggum gentleman. Come on, we're cooking steaks tonight. Uh, just come on over, we're cooking steaks, yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. You <laughs> fell in love right there, that steak, that's what it was. <laughs> it was that steak that got you. you go, well, I don't know, this guy's kind of a goo, but... <laughs> Cooks a hell of a steak. Huh? I see That's potential. I do like beef. I see potential. I never had one that good. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, I know your chicken cooking has changed, probably. Yeah, because you know the first thing. I, I mean, you used to win the chicken ancillary contest. all the time. Yeah, it was How a boneless, skinless thighs, marinated tang dressing, seasoned with just uh, man, probably number five. <laughs> Back in the day, and then uh, Corky's barbecue sauce. You would just grill them hot and fast. Hot and fast, and then uh, slather them in that Corky's, sweetened up some. I mean, I'd mix it up. That was the base of it, and uh, it, we won a bunch. But then we got into KCBS cooking, where everybody was cooking bone in thighs, skin on, and it was a game changer. Yeah. I mean, my chicken was horrible. Oh, I mean, gosh. it was there. We've had some bad chicken, and then we. I mean, we. I've tried. I tried everything to get to where we are. And chicken. I mean, you know, when I was moving trophies over, and I know Waylon's got a lot of trophies, but when we were moving them from the house to the office, um, then we had a lot of chicken trophies. A lot of chicken first trophies. First place chicken trophies. We've dialed chicken in. We probably had more first place chicken trophies. I'd say, you know, I would. it would be a fair bet that I've cooked more chicken than I have ribs. Just because chicken's cheaper, and I didn't know how to cook it, so I practiced and practiced and practiced and yeah. tried different things and got it down. You know, I mean, we still cook thighs at home. We don't do them comp style, but we cook thighs all the time. Comp style thighs is still pretty good. I'd, they are. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of work to cook. You're not going to cook yeah. them at home, but I mean, they are. I don't know. There's something about them when they come off on a Saturday morning. You're ready to try some barbecue and you hadn't had your taste buds jacked up. And I don't know if it's because it's so, uh, I'm so hungry. By that but, time, yeah, but you're might, ready for them, yeah. and they're so good. Yeah, I agree. If chicken brisket, went last, it'd probably be like this sucks. You know, <laughs> I love brisket, but when bit, by the time brisket rolls around, I'm like, I tasted too much. Yeah, hey, I don't know if it's so much tasted and it's just smelling it, and you know, to me, all that richness and the and the sauce and everything, it just it blows you out so fast. I I, I used to judge KCBS. I don't like judging it anymore. It's too much. I mean, trying all that stuff, it just it, to me, I mean, everything's so loaded up with MSG mm-hmm. and over the top and it's sauced up. It's it's not my favorite thing to judge. You have to do it to stay kind of current, but I'd much rather judge steak contest. Oh yeah, I haven't got burnt out on ribeye yet. Well, we've done several like <laughs> local contests where it's just a rib or, or just rib chicken wings. Chicken. Yeah, no, yeah. I like those. Yeah. You don't get you don't get burnt out on those as bad. But you got to think if you're going through. A table, six entries, four categories. That's 24 bites that you at least have to take. 
Some of it you take two bites. And don't I mean don't think you can go in there and try to eat the whole uh-uh. whole sample of everything you try you're because man it'll it. you're you'll be it. sick. You'll be tapping out. You'll be but... tapping out quick. <laughs> Do you feel like you have more to learn? Heck yeah, so much more. I'm still learning. Man, and I I say this every I mean all the time. I think you've heard me say it. I still feel like we're just getting started. Mm-hmm. That, you know, we've been doing it for 10 plus years, a lot longer, and I still feel like we're rookies. I feel like we're just now starting to figure a little bit of it out. Yeah, just starting to get a grasp (laughs) on some of it. I feel like we're at a point, or I'm at a point where I know that, that, the next step is like, you know, I can, I can see it and, and I'm so hungry to get there and to get better and all that. I feel educated enough to, you know, to kind of, to know what direction, to take that direction. Yeah. Yeah, If that makes any sense. Yeah. It's not as hard and uh, new, you know, because yeah. I mean, firing up a grill and a lot of that's second nature, but perfecting it is what well. it's like. I guess it's like playing golf. You're always trying to get, you know, play that perfect game or whatever. And once you kind of learn the basics of how grills work and, you know, airflow and things like that, you can kind of troubleshoot and work on new grills, you know, yeah, yeah. once you have that basic principle down. Mm hmm. Or I, you know, that's how I feel. I don't look at it quite that scientific, I guess. Yeah. But, but yeah. But you could now that you know how four or five different types of grills cool. work, you can apply that knowledge towards something new. Yeah, yeah, towards some center blocks and tin. Yeah, for that's real. That's what I was gonna ask. <laughs> uh, what are some methods that you've never done but would like to try? Anything off the top of your head? I've never cooked on one of those. Uh, how do you? It's that like Cuban. Microwave, like La like cachahina, or however you say that. How do you say it? Something like that, like yeah. cachahina, yeah. Cajun microwave. Yeah, yeah, I've never cooked on one of those. I'd like to. I almost I asked Mark Williams. I said, "Should I get Malcolm this for Christmas?" I was thinking about it, and he went, "Yeah, I mean, it's not something I'd want to keep, but I'd like to go somewhere where they're oh, cooking okay. on one and learn how to cook on it." That's a luau style to me. Yeah, yeah and that would be fun to do that. Throw a beach luau. Cook a hog like that, but then you got to store it. And I got a hog. I got a couple hog cookers, you know. That's true. You've never cooked but, a hog over, you know, like that old school over pit. I've I've been a, I've I've been a part of it. I've never done it solely by myself. Yeah. We went down to a buddy of mine's place outside of. It's kind of outside of Vicksburg, and we cooked this. They cook a hog there every year, and they've got he's got the old brick pit and. The way he does it, it's really smart. He has a big party and kind of a half of it's a prep party. And then the other half is the feeding party. Well, the guy, you know, you, you take shifts, you go and it's pretty much you stay up all night and drink whiskey and <laughs> take your two hours shoveling coal. And that's what we did. I didn't stay all night. I did my, you know, I helped them prep it and get it on and stayed the first few hours. And then I come back the next day, <laughs> but, uh, I had a, I, that was a lot of fun. I mean, that's, that's the true way, you know, um, I've never done any where they dig a hole and do it in the ground. Yeah. That, that would be pretty cool. Yeah. No, there's a lot of stuff that I hadn't done. I mean, I'm, I just, that's what, that's what popped into my head. Yeah. I wonder if there, I, I was asking if there was anything like top of the list. No. <laughs> there's enough other stuff I'm working on that I yeah. don't have to. <laughs> what are some meats that you've never cooked that you'd like to? Man, I don't know. Is there any horse? No. <laughs> I'm not going to cook horse. <laughs> yeah. huh. I'll stick with what I know. What were we talking I mean. about the other day? In, uh, what was in, it? It's something like the, they eat dogs and it's usually beagle. Oh, man. It's really not. <laughs> I don't want to hear that. Yeah, no, I wouldn't do anything. I don't, I'm not exotic. I like yeah. I like the main, you know, whatever we got in America. <laughs> I'm pro-American meat. What about goat? I'd try goat. I mean, I cook deer. Is that, that's close. That's, that's close. a wild goat. But, uh. I'm not trying to get exotic on mm-hmm. anything. That's just, I mean, I would, but it ain't my my favorite. You give me a brisket or a pork shoulder or some ribs or whole hog. That's that's my thing. I love cooking hog. It's the I, I tell everybody when I get asked, "What's your favorite thing to cook?" It's whole hog because it's such a process, and the cooking of it's really easy. I mean, you're just maintaining the fire once you get it on. It's all in the prep that gets it on, and. It takes a couple people to do it, and that's that's fun to me. Hanging out with my friends, having a few cold ones, you know, the whole thing of getting the hog on and then staying up with it, maintaining those temps, and then feeding a bunch of people when it's done. That's 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 what barbecue is. 
hanging out and good socializing, good eating. That's why that's why I like doing it. We need to do another whole hog. Yeah. It's been a year. The next one I do, I want to do uh running style on on Black Betty. I'll get her get her cleaned up and uh, do do a running style haul because I've never done a video on a running style. That'd be cool. Do you need a special bar? Mm-mm. Mm-mm. You know how they use that bar to hold them up. Oh, you know what the shed style thing? Yeah, I would love like to a have one of those. Hulk is what they call I'd love it. to have that. Yeah, I actually had a guy, Brad, uh, Boudin Brad was supposed to be. It was Dab was supposed to be making some of those or something. So he was going to. I had looked. It's been a while. I need to call Brad. What would you do if you did not have that? You just put it down. Oh, yeah. Just yeah, just like I did those suckling pigs. I just lay there. Yeah. I mean, you can still stuff them with stuff to keep the cavity up. You don't have to. There's a lot of guys that just cook them, you know, just form them up, and they're going to stay. Cook them right. Sometimes you can use sticks to lay beside them and hold them up. You've seen that? Do you um, think you'll look back and talk about sous vide? About how great Finally, it is? Yeah. One day. Uh, you We're know, talking about yeah. evolution. That where I started with it, and I don't know. <laughs> if you fell in love. Maybe if I have to move off planet or something. That's only, there's no, if we don't have any flame to cook on, I got to boil everything. <laughs> I'm sure. Maybe. Space cooking. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, there's a place for it. I've always said that. I mean, there's restaurants that Just use it. Just not in your you, kitchen. <laughs> I'm not saying it's not my kitchen. If you know, I've had some stuff on it. I can I can be my mind can be changed. I'm, I'm like you know, show me. It's not something I'm gonna practice on. I don't think. I tell I tell you this. I'll put my ribeye steak up against anybody's that Sue feeds it. I'd like to try that. Yeah, that'd it, be a good video. It would. How, you know what? I need to get somebody to do that. Get Mark to bring their sous vide in and let's get an unbiased somebody to try it and see who's come out. Uh, see yeah, who. or get a few people. Yeah, a couple. Let them vote blind on it. See yeah. which one's better. Do a three, three I judges. Would, I'd just about put money that the one grilled's going to be better. But they're CV and, and grilling, correct? Yeah, you, you are yeah. grilling it at the end, but it's just there's something about that that charcoal, man. Even the beefer can't do that. It puts the sear on it, but it doesn't put it that. Doesn't give that flavor. You know what I want to try on that beefer? Going back to that is doing a reverse sear because you could put some you could put a steak on there and do the reverse sear on it and just put it in there and sear it real fast. What are you talking about smoking it? Yeah. Smoking your steak and yep. then throwing it on the there to crisp up that. Sear it up. Yep. I guarantee it'd be good. Yeah. Don't I might do that with some fillets. I mean, be a good way to do fillets. Uh, yeah. Just for some practice. I mean, when you get time to practice. Yeah. When I get some practice time. So, um, I collected some questions from our video last week. Lamb shoulder chops. Alrighty. And I'm going to throw them at you. You're going to answer them. Could you do the same process with a flat iron steak or a London broil? Yeah. Flat iron. It, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it with the, I really wouldn't do it with the London broil. You could, but to me, those, both those cuts are better served, you know, medium rare to medium because of the fat content. Now it would be better with a chuck roast. Something that's got a lot of fat to it, yeah. you know, that's got some some marbling in it. Um, you'd, you'd it'd be better or short ribs, you know, which those just come off the chuck roast or uh, osabuco or you know shanks, whatever. Yeah. That that those kind of cuts are going to do better to that braise because the lamb shoulder chops you grilled them a little bit, but you braised them. Yeah, and, and that's what them broke down, them down. Yeah, and then served them over mashed potatoes with the sauce. Right. Right. Uh, <laughs> Justin says, your voice makes me feel like I'm being held tight in an angel's arms. Well, that's awful nice. <laughs> what, uh, who was that? Uh, me too, Justin. Is that me the way you, <laughs> you too? <laughs> I, feel, I feel like that uh, show on Saturday Night that skit on Saturday Night Live where the, you know, the people, they, they sit there and they talk real sweet and real soothing. The and, sweaty balls. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's real nice. Um. Somebody said that they found the chops to be more expensive, but if you can get um, chop regular loin chops are now the yeah. shoulder chops, I would buy a bone in shoulder just have the butcher cut it. That's the way to do it. I don't know. I'm not, I don't even know if they the sell cheaper. them. I've never seen them. I mean, we don't see a lot of lamb, and really, it's only a few times a year they put 
a good selection yeah. out. There's usually some lamb, but it's not always a good selection. This one says uh, you could use boneless leg of lamb. Yeah, that would work great too. Yeah. Now, I do see the, it depends on the leg because a lot of times on that, it's just the big, like, top round of the leg, <laughs> that, the big roast. And those are better to me cooked to the rare to medium rare. Because it depends on the, it depends on the cut. It needs to have <coughs> it needs to have a lot of marbling in it, you know, to to really break it down like that. And I guess you could take a whole leg and break it down. I yeah. don't know. It might be dry or stringy. I don't know. The shoulder wasn't. I think the shoulder no. and the neck, I mean, the brisket area of it, braise. all that does better. Even the lamb ribs, you can braise them down like that, and that's what I did in lamb rib video. You yeah, know? we just we treated them like. Pork ribs, but you're breaking them down, braising them, and wrapping them up full. Um, we get this question every time you use that cast iron pot. They want to know what capacity is it. I want to say it's, it's a five, five, quart. five quart Dutch oven. Yeah, a lot. It's a lodge. It a lodge. Yeah. We found it on clearance. Man, at Kroger for like twelve bucks. Yeah. That was a steal. I don't know. I don't know. It was in the markdown section. We always always stroll through there to see what they have, <laughs> and they, I was like, man, I got to get that. If anything less, it's a perfect bean pot. I can yeah. throw it on a smoker. I don't care if it gets burnt up. But the more I cook on it, the better seasoned it gets. And we've used that. We use it all the time. Yeah, yeah. we do. I fried fish in it. Yeah. Matthew says, how many beers till you start playing the air guitar? You don't really play air guitar. Uh, I get you the play real, real one guitar. out. Yeah, I get the real one out. And uh, how many the beers? The question should be, know. how many beers till you start rapping? <laughs> more shots more shots beers i'm functioning fine it's the it's the other stuff that gets you this person marcus said they um love lamb shoulder chops they grill them over mesquite and serve them medium rare to rare hmm. i wonder if they're tough that's what they're I, would t- think. I would think they would be i don't know very mesquitey too yeah um, it's getting strong. It's yeah. kind of strong for me. It just has a bitterness. I've, I hadn't had good luck with it. Monte Cristo says, if you play this at two times the speed and get stoned, it'll be awesome. <laughs> me get stoned and play it twice the speed? No. I guess oh, oh he listens. Yeah, yeah. And then you play that, it maybe that was a, did, he, did he send that on 420? <laughs> <laughs> it was last week, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, Somebody want to know what kind of pellets did you use? Do you remember? I don't remember. I think they were just Traeger Cherry is what I had in there. I poured, and I didn't have any Memphis pellets, so I had some Traeger Cherry pellets, and I poured them in there. But uh, how much do difference like does the, it make with pellet flavors? You can pick up some on it. I think I think really the quality of the pellet makes more of a difference than anything. And I mean, my go tos are Barbecue's Delight when I have them. Um, now I do. There's a comp- B&B has a competition blend that I like. It's like hickory, cherry, pecan, and I really like it. I use or it's, maybe it's hickory oak and cherry or something like that. I forget what the three are, but it's three blended into one. I like it. And then I mean, as long as you use something decent, it, it shouldn't give you any trouble. But if you're going to use an old pellets that you've just had sitting out and it's some dampness to them, they're not going to burn good. But uh, sugar maple is one of my favorites to use, and I, I mean. Um, back, uh, it's barbecue's delight makes a really good sugar maple, maple pellet. Um, Brendan said it's been too long since you did a new rib video. You know, I Keith came and did the last one. Yeah. And it was I'm going to have to do, I'm going to have to do my style of ribs. Well, you know, you've done some flavored ribs and those are kind of my favorite. You did a, a Korean the Jack Daniels. Ones you did were good. a jerk. You did yeah. Jack Daniels. Is that a rib? I had on my yeah. list to do a Bahamian rib after I went down to the Bahamas, yeah. but they didn't have ribs. They didn't have ribs in the Bahamas. <laughs> so I was like, well, I'm going to scratch that. Maybe I need to make that a thing. Yeah. But yeah, um, I plan on doing some ribs, and I do have some big beef ribs in the freezer, and I'm probably going to do those around Memorial Day. I'll be releasing a video on that. Um, I'm going to do them on the old hickory because I've got four big racks. And I need some space. So that's probably that I can't wait to that one. Honestly, that's one I've been looking forward yeah. to. Um, this person had a good uh, point. They said those chops are huge. What size animal was that from? That's a good question. Was it really a lamb? You were eating sheep. I don't, I don't think so. Hell, I don't know. 
<laughs> they were pretty big. How big the lambs get before they consider them a, a ewe or is it? I mean, the ones sheep? we used to show were, you know, 120 pounds. And they're still a lamb? Or is it a sheep then? I'd call it a sheep. I don't know. I'm, I'm, hey, I was told they were lamb shoulder chops. Do you want some lamb to cook? Yes. And <laughs> I'll send you some lamb. What, um, if you don't want to use red wine, do you have any substitution? Just add more beef broth? Yeah, I would. You know, a little red wine vinegar. Yeah. A balsamic. Something like that would work really well. I wouldn't well. use as much. I wouldn't go red wine yeah, for red wine vinegar. Would, not equal parts, but, yeah. you know, if I, I mean, water, half water, half wine would work. Yeah. You could use a fruit juice. Uh, that would work. Just more broth, more stock. You could, you could put some vegetable stock or just add some more. Just watch your salts on some of that if you're using your broths or your stocks. Make sure they're not overly, overly salty. Somebody, sorry. Somebody wanted to, uh, the correct herb to use with lamb is mint. Yeah. I've never liked mint on lamb. I'm, I'm just, Me mint, either. mint belongs in gum or juleps. <laughs> you know, that's a peppermint maybe during Christmas, but. I would try I it. I, everybody says you got to have the mint jelly if you're going to have lamb. I don't know where that came from. I don't That's, like it. I, tr- I mean. It's not my thing. I'd rather have pepper jelly. I've I can see pepper jelly and lamb being really good. But mint is, I don't know. Mint, to me, I don't I don't like it. I've tried it, but it's always been on like a buffet, you know. Yeah. I, I, I didn't think it was that great. I, I'm not a fan. Yeah. I, I, I like more of a savoriness and maybe some spice. So I would. Me personally, if I was gonna do that, I'd use pepper jelly. If you wanted to serve a jelly, have you? Ever, I mean, you know how they make those. You can even buy some of the store bought pepper jellies that are green like that. That they because you know you think of lamb and mint jelly. It's usually that green stuff or whatever. <laughs> um, to me, I like the herbiness. You know. Yeah, that's. I mean, the, the rosemary, the parsley, yes. the garlic, yes. all that stuff. The 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 citrus zest. All that's great with lamb, and I think if you put mint in there, it might ruin it. For me, that's just me. Hey, I'm, I'm not a, a lamb professional hey, you at like all. Mint, mint it up. Mint it up. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not going to tell you not to. Um, but it's really good with bourbon. <laughs> what lamb? Mint juleps. Oh, <laughs> it's that time. The derby's coming up. I'd love to go to the derby. Maybe one of these days. Um. So you got a hat? I can make a hat. Okay. I, I can, you can I can get you a hat. I don't know. You're the one needs the hat. I just need to mint you. <laughs> <laughs> the women wear the hats, right? Yeah. So this weekend. Spring Fest. That's on my radar. Um, you got Michael doing the kids cook. Michael is it's Michael, Will, Carter, and Brady. Their team. I, I asked them, I said, what's y'all's team name? We're going to be the killer dogs. <laughs> they went original. <laughs> they're the killer dogs. So they're doing the hamburgers and chicken. And then we're going to tune up our Memphis and May rib recipe and hopefully be back to report next week that we did well with it. Yeah. Monday we leave uh, for Cleveland. We're going to Cleveland to go to the beef council to see what, to learn about some new cuts of beef and how to use them and make some yeah. sausage. The, I'm really looking forward to the sausage making because that's something I want to get into. Yeah. That's something you've been working on here lately. Yeah. So they're going to, um, I'm going to see if I can get tired of beef. Oh, yeah. <laughs> see if they can feed me enough. You're going to get gout. <laughs> I'm mix in a bunch of water or some vegetables with that beef. <laughs> but the Beef Council um, is inviting some people from the barbecue industry and the barbecue community to come in. They're going to educate them on different cuts and different ways to utilize beef. And, yeah. Michael was texting me to see if he's going to have a game. I don't know. Is it raining outside? It might be raining at home. But, yeah, I'm looking forward to that Beef Council trip. We'll be back to report. Hopefully, we're going to take some video there maybe, mm-hmm. share that. And if y'all follow us on Instagram, we'll, we'll, be, we'll definitely stories. be doing some posts. So, hopefully, I can get some sausage-making tips, uh, maybe show some of that live or something. Or yeah. at least do a story on Instagram. We've been, we've been trying to work on our stories. So, if you follow us there um, – we're, we're going to try to show you some interesting stuff, hopefully. So, and we'll put some stuff on Facebook, too, I'm sure. And uh, no video next week. No video. We'll ne- oh, we're out of town. Yeah. Um, so when we come back, I hadn't even thought that far of what I'm going to do. Well, I thought Man. you were going to do the big beef ribs, but you said you're going to wait to Memorial Day yeah. for that 
after Memphis MA? It might be, uh, i tell you what it might be. It might be a week late, too, because Cinco de Mayo, but uh, probably I may do some. I've got some skirt steak, and I've got some flank steak that I need to do something with. So I may do some tacos. I'm, I'm all for you that. You know it. Taco Tuesday. That's it a good day be. to do them on. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, was well, that it? Is that all we're going to talk about? That's podcast. Well, we appreciate y'all joining us this week. And um, if you like what we're doing, go to YouTube, watch the videos, and subscribe. Shell, tell them where they can find us on everything else. If you'd like to connect with Malcolm, it's how to BBQ right at Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and of course YouTube. If you'd like to connect with me, it's Miss Southern Shell on Instagram and Twitter. And Minnie's got a page somewhere out there if y'all are interested in her little white fluffy dog. So <laughs> she's on Very Instagram. Very mainly. The real Very mighty Minnie. We'll see y'all next time. <laughs>